Let's construct a perpendicular bisector, our very first construction. You'll recall we line up our compass and we get ourselves a couple good arcs there. I hope this rings a bell. This is what we did in our very first construction. Move our compass over here. The needle is on the B now, swinging through A, and we swing around till we get a nice couple intersections there. That's good. And then there it is, our perpendicular bisector. It's, of course, perpendicular, and it bisects segment AB. Now, that's old school. That's from Chapter 2. Let me put a couple points on there. I'll call it CP. I'll make P a point of intersection, and I'm going to draw these segments in here. The perpendicular bisector theorem tells me that these segments, CA and CB, are congruent. Makes sense. Should look familiar to you. Looks like an isosceles triangle, and it looks like the perpendicular bisector is the, let's say, the altitude between two congruent right triangles. Many ways to see it, but those two magenta segments are congruent. Now let's explore the converse of the perpendicular bisector theorem. Starting with segment AB, this time I'm going to put a point D out here, which is equidistant from A and B. Equidistant means these two blue segments are the same. You might say isosceles triangle DAB with vertex at D. Let's set this into motion. And you can see we're going to trace out this orange line here. I'm going to put in some tick marks because this orange line I'm tracing is in fact the perpendicular bisector. So if I have a point, in this case D, which is equidistant from A and B, then it is on this orange line, the perpendicular bisector. Great question. You've got a triangle, ABC, and let's see, you've got a point P, it's on the interior, so point P is somewhere inside this figure, and it's um, equidistant from points A and B. Hmm. Find out where it must be. Well, let's draw this picture. Here's a point P. It's on the interior, and these magenta segments tell me it's on the interior of triangle ABC. So let's check first. It says must be located. Well, located on AB? Well, AB would be down here. Now, I guess that'd be on the figure. I don't know that you'd call that inside the figure, but the fact is it doesn't have to be there. So I would have to cross this one off. I'm going to cross off A. No good. Can't be. Okay. Well, let's look at C since it's just down here. The mid segment opposite AB. Well, the mid segment opposite AB would be right there. And certainly P could be on it. It could be on the mid segment, but it might be off it, like right there. So I'm going to have to say this is a sometimes, and that means no. And going around, let's look at D. Ah, boy, I've got two others to consider. The perpendicular bisector of AC. Well, this is the perpendicular bisector of AC. It goes through the midpoint, and it's perpendicular. Well, again, point P could be on this line right there. But again, it doesn't have to be. Oops, I'm messing up. So I'm going to have to cross this one off. In our final contestant, the perpendicular bisector of AB. Well, that's the very definition. The perpendicular bisector, if a point is equidistant from the endpoints of a segment, and that would be AB, then by definition, as long as it's coplanar, it is on the perpendicular bisector. So all these points are on the perpendicular bisector of AB. Your answer is clearly B. Well, let's see if we can find the problem here. Um, let's see, AB will pass through C. Well, AB is a perpendicular bisector of DE. Right there, there's your bisector, and there's the perpendicular mark. And imagine it looks like it will. But here's the problem. I don't see any tick marks here. C is not equidistant. These two magenta segments are just not congruent or equal. 
C could be over here or over here, anywhere like that. Well, let's use this diagram to answer the five questions. First one, number 11, find NM. Well, given top sentence JN, that's over here, is the perpendicular bisector. I see the perpendicular side. The other half of that phrase is bisector. So right away, we've got one answer. We know that NM must be 35. Okay, well, that was the easy one. Let's see what else we've got. Now we're going to find JK. Well, again, this J is on the perpendicular bisector, so JK must be congruent to JM. So let's use that fact. So we'll set their two measures equal to each other. Solve for Y, they're our variable, and our variable comes up 7. Well, now it's just plain substitution. Let me take, see, we want JK. Let's take this expression, and we'll solve for JK. JK is 43. And I'm willing to bet if you put that in here, you'd have, see, 7, 7 is 49, minus 6, 43. That's a good thing to check. JM is also 43. But now we're asked for KL. Well, straightforward there. 7 7s plus 1 is 50. And how about ML? 9 7s minus 13. And what do you know? That's also 50. And our final question is L on JP. So is this on the perpendicular bisector? And all we'd have to do to answer that, let me first draw it where it really belongs to scale. Since we just solved for them, both those segments are 50, L should actually be over here. So I'm going to move it over there. Because those two are congruent. If they're equidistant from the endpoints of a segment, M and K, then by our theorems, they are on the perpendicular bisector. So it is, I would have to say, yes, they are. Um, L is on JP. Well, let's perform our very first classical construction yet again. This time, we're going to pay attention to our new theorems. We're going to construct the perpendicular bisector of RS. We'll start with a compass. Putting the needle on R, we're going to swing an arc through S, and you know, we're looking, swinging in this region because we're expecting an intersection around there. So then we'll reposition our compass, put the needle on the S, and swing the arc through R. Just like we've done so many times before, we really are just looking for that intersection right there, and that one. And there you go. So now, let's identify those two intersections. I'll just give them letters T and V. And if you look at them, you're going to notice something. All these segments are congruent. This and this are both the radius of the blue circle. This is the radius of the red circle, and so is this one. And the two circles have the same radii. In other words, all four of these segments are congruent. Well, they don't have to be all four, but since these two are congruent, T is equidistant from R and S. And since these two are congruent, V is equidistant from R and S. And that brings to mind the converse of the perpendicular bisector theorem. And that means that is our perpendicular bisector. That is why the construction works. Well, here we go with a quick proof of the perpendicular bisector theorem, exercise number 26 in your book. So we'll start with my diagram here. I just drew CP passing through a, the segment AB. And now I'm going to add this, mark the drawing as I go. The bisector part of the definition is there, and the perpendicular part is right there. After all, it's a perpendicular bisector. So now let's say, well, perpendicular lines do form right angles. Notice I'm kind of trimming it from what we used to do in chapter two. Let's uh, see, right angles are congruent. We used to say if two angles are right angles, then they are congruent. But I think you've got enough practice now. Let's just make some tracks here. 
Aha, CP is congruent to itself by the reflexive property. And I can see a pair of congruent triangles, therefore, by side angle side. And I can see this one and this one. So these two triangles, which are, of course, reflections of each other, by the way, are congruent by side angle side. And therefore, I'll say by corresponding parts of congruent triangles, or CPCTC, whatever you want to call it, their corresponding parts must also be equal. Therefore, CA is congruent to CB. I could make another line to say that the measures of CA, or the measure CA, is equal to the measure of CB. And by the definition, if two segments are congruent, they have the same measures. Well, let's prove the converse of the perpendicular bisector theorem. This is theorem 5.3. I'm going to start here with an isosceles triangle. And I'm going to prove that C is on the perpendicular bisector of AB. Well, let's go. First thing I'll do is, well, instead of the parallel postulate, the perpendicular postulate for any line and point not on the line, I can draw exactly one line perpendicular to AB passing through this point. Ah, easy. Now, perpendicular lines form right angles. We remember that. Then, our good friend the reflexive property tells us this side being used on both triangles. There we go. HL, these two triangles, again, are congruent. And finally, our corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent, CPCTC, which is to say these two corresponding parts are congruent. And, um, well, I guess that's it. It's because now I've got the perpendicular part and I've got the bisector part. And there you go. That makes CP the perpendicular bisector of AB.